first reading this morning comes from 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. We announce to you what existed from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have seen and our hands handled about the word of life. The life was revealed and we have seen, and we have testify and announce to you the eternal life that was the Father and was revealed to us. What we have seen and heard, we also announce it to you, so that you can have fellowship with us. Our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy can be complete. Please rise for the reading of the Gospel. Our Gospel lesson this morning comes from the book of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was with God in the beginning. Everything came into being through the Word, and without the Word, nothing came into being. What came into being through the Word was life, and the life was the light for all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness doesn't extinguish the light. A man named John was sent from God, he came as a witness to testify concerning the light, so that through him everyone would believe in the light. He himself was not the light, but his mission was to testify concerning the light. The true light that shines on all people was coming into the world. The light was in the world, and the world came into being through the light, but the world didn't recognize the light. The light came to his own people, and his own people did not welcome him. But those who did welcome him, those who believe in his name, he authorized to become God's children, born not from blood, nor from human desire or passion, but born from God. The word became flesh, and he made his home among us. We have seen his glory, glory like that of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. John testified about him, crying out, this is the one of whom I said, he who comes after me is greater than me because he existed before me. From his fullness we have all received grace upon grace as the law was given through Moses. So grace and truth came into being through Jesus Christ. None has ever seen God. God, the only son who is at the Father's side, has made God known. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thank you, you. May please be seated. This is uh, Epiphany Sunday on the church calendar, the Sunday where we celebrate uh, the visit of the Magi to the child Jesus, and all the decorations are, are down. Technically, they probably should stay up until the last day of Christmas, which was yesterday, and uh, we took ours down yesterday, so that was good, but um, we're, we're thankful for our art committee for transforming our sanctuary back, and we'll, we'll continue on until we go until uh, Lent, which will happen at the beginning of March. But we're also beginning another season here, and that is uh, a season where we're going to be diving deep into one of the Gospels, the Gospel of John, and this series is going to take us from now all the way through Easter, actually to a couple weeks after Easter, as we dive deeply into this gospel. And Jason and I are really excited about this because it gives us a chance to really uh, take out all of our good biblical work and uh, to dive into those texts more deeply. And we want to invite you to do the same. So as you are uh, going through this series, you'll notice in your bulletin, and you can also down this, download this online if you're watching us online. We're streaming live this morning. And um, uh, you can download that and do the daily readings that will help you uh, enhance your, your experience of going through the Gospel of John. We also have two new Sunday school classes that are meeting at the 930 hour that are doing a, an extensive study on John, and you can join those as well. 
if you'd like to put together a Bible study of your own, maybe you've got something else going on at the 9.30 hour, you'd like to do that, just contact us here in the office. We'd love to get you connected with the material that we're using for that, uh, which is done by Dr. Ben Witherington, who's a professor at Asbury Theological Seminary, where Jason and I both went to school. So there are lots of opportunities for you to, to get deep in the Gospel of John. And we're gonna start that this morning with an introduction, but before we do that, let's pray together. God, we are thankful for your presence with us this day, that we can gather in the power of your Holy Spirit. Send your Spirit on us to open us to what you have to say to us through this story, as John tells it, in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, one of the things that I had a chance to do this summer on my renewal leave was to visit London, and one of the highlights of visiting London was a little museum that that uh, Rob and I, my son and I went to, it was the Churchill War Rooms Museum there in London, which is the, the underground facility underneath Whitehall, right there in the Westminster area, uh, where the Prime Minister Winston Churchill actually ran sort of the British war effort out of there during the course of the war from about late 1939 all the way through until August 1945. And it's a fascinating museum on so many levels. The, the war rooms are preserved just like they were in those days uh, because when they finished using them in 1945, they simply turned out the lights and left everything there. And so in 1948, when they rediscovered it, they went back down and, and uh, decided to make a museum out of it. So the stuff was already there. They didn't have to go collect it. And it's a fascinating museum because you go from point to point and they, they give you one of those audio things that automatically connects whenever you, a wireless audio thing that connects when you go to the next thing. And normally I don't like these things because as a historian, I already read the book, right? So, so I, I'm not a big fan of those, but this was fascinating because you can listen to these and they have interviews from people who actually worked down there during the war. And it was fascinating because of the stories that they told and some of the stories were about Winston Churchill, who was the prime minister, and he's a fascinating figure. For example, you'll notice when you walk around the war rooms, these underground rooms, there are signs that say silence everywhere. Not because they were trying to be tactical, but because Winston Churchill hated extraneous noise. So the secretaries, for example, had to have imported silent typewriters because Churchill didn't like the sound of typewriters clacking. So they brought in special typewriters to use in that place. All kinds of stories like this that you saw when you walk around these war rooms. It takes about two hours to go through, and it's amazing. The center part is a museum dedicated to the life of Winston Churchill, and it's amazingly well done. Trust me, I am someone who's in a, a museum junkie. This is in the top three of museums I've ever visited in my life really well interpreted, and it, and it did what a museum is supposed to do, and that is to spark additional desire to go and learn more. And so for Christmas, I asked for a new biography of Winston Churchill that just came out, I think in August. Well, okay, I asked for it. I actually ordered it, and, <laughs> and it came, and Jennifer wrapped it, and I opened it on Christmas morning, but, but it's, uh, it's 1,500 pages. It's a brick, man, but it's awesome. I'm about a third of the way through it, and, uh, and I love reading about this life that is by turns interesting, uh, inspirational, and infuriating all at the same time. Because Churchill was a complex person, as most people are who, who live. You know, we're all a, a contradiction in terms at times. And, and you can see how Churchill was such a strong figure, a strong leader, but at the same time would, would drive other people crazy. And, and I love that about him. Um, maybe it's because I have the same in my own personality, but, but there's something about that that some of you laugh. You say, right, we, we know that. We know that. You've been here for eight and a half years. We get it. Um, but, but I love one of the stories about him where a lady asked her, was so infuriated with, with Winston that she said to him, she said, she said, if you were my husband, I would put poison in your tea. And Churchill looked back at her and said, Madam, if I were your husband, I would drink it. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> 
It's perfect. That's Churchill. And I love this biography because it, it goes further than some biographies. Most famous people have a lot of biographies written about them. And you can tell kind of, there's like a history of biographies too, based on sources that come available. Now, as a, as a history major and, and being trained as, as, as a historian, one of the things you're always looking for is primary source material. The more primary source material you have, that's material that was written by people who were there at the time, either by the person themselves or by those who were connected to them. And this particular biography of Churchill actually has some new primary source material connected to it. The Queen actually authorized Andrew Roberts to look at King George VI diaries from the war years, which reveal his relationship with Churchill in a really powerful way. So I, I love that. And it, it got me thinking about the fact that we have now more available to us, and stuff is being found all the time, that allows us to deepen these biographies of people. Jennifer's reading the biography of U.S. Grant by Ron Chernow, who's a marvelous biographer. And we're finding more and more. When I read that biography, I realized that the one I had read in the 80s uh, by, by another author uh, actually had added so much more because there was so much more primary source material coming to the forefront. That's unusual for us because in the ancient world, biography was a lot more difficult because there wasn't a lot of primary source material. People didn't write as much, and those who did usually wrote long after the fact. One of the famous biographies of the ancient world was Plutarch's Lives. Plutarch, who was a Greek historian, but wrote in the second century AD during sort of the height of the Roman Empire. And he was writing about people like Alexander the Great, who had lived some 500 years before. And so there was not a lot of primary source material for him to work with, and so he writes his biography kind of as a, kind of as a moralism. Here are some of the great things about Alexander the Great. And, and sometimes when you're distant from that, biography can turn into what historians call hagiography, which is turning someone into a saint, right? That's part of the process. But if you have primary source material, you learn more and more. You learn the truth about a particular person. Interestingly, one of the people in the ancient world who we know the most about from primary source biography is Jesus of Nazareth. What we have in our Bibles are four Gospels, four different biographies of the same person, almost unprecedented in the ancient world. Think about emperors and kings and others who don't have as much written about them as Jesus himself had. We have four Gospels, four versions of the story. And those, those versions all tell the same story, but they tell them in very different ways, don't they? I mean, if you've read through the Gospels, you know that, that each one has a very specific, distinct character. For example, think about Matthew, Mark, and Luke. These are known as the synoptic Gospels. There's a good seminary word for you, the synoptics, because synoptic means to be seen together. And when we say seen together, it means that Matthew, Mark, and Luke seem to share a lot of similar material. That led scholars to come up with a theory called the four source theory, which suggested that Mark was written first because it's the shortest one. We call it the Reader's Digest version of the gospel. It moves very quickly. But Matthew and Luke both seem to borrow almost verbatim stories from Mark, but not always the same stories. And then Matthew and Luke also have a source that... that Mark doesn't seem to have that contains a lot of the teaching material of Jesus. The Sermon on the Mount, the Sermon on the Plain, things like that, which led some scholars to posit that, that there's a lost document out there called Q, which is short for the German word quella or writings. And so if you could find Q, that would be a very Indiana Jones thing for you to do, and it would prove a lot of scholars right. But it's a theory. We don't know for sure where that source came from. But the synoptic gospels all have similar things about them. But then there's John, right? John, if you've read the Gospel of John, is a very different animal. It is not much like the synoptics at all. Sure, there are some connections of the stories, and sure, it all winds up with the death and resurrection of Jesus. But rather like the synoptics, where you have lots of teaching of Jesus and the parables and, and things move rather rapidly, John tends to linger it tends to be a series of conversations that Jesus has with people. Longer conversations, conversations that can take 
a whole chapter of the text. When we look at the Gospel of John, we're seeing something quite different. And what we're seeing also is that John is the only one of the Gospels that in its internal witness claims to be a primary source, written by someone who saw and touched and experienced everything that happened. Now, the synoptics are written very close to the time of Jesus, probably connected to people who were there. The interviews of people, some say, for example, that Mark is Peter's reflections given to an editor. But John's own internal witness is that this person who wrote it was there. We see that in a couple of places. For example, chapter 1, verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. We eyewitnessed his glory. Chapter 21, verse 24. This is how the, the author signs it. This is the disciple who is testifying about these things and has written them. And we know that his testimony is true. It's an eyewitness account. It's a primary source. So who wrote it? Who is this author? Who is John? Well, it's interesting that the earliest manuscripts don't have an ascription to them. The ascription to John comes about the second century. The internal witness is a little more vague about who the writer is. Tradition says it was John the Apostle, the son of Zebedee, brother of James, one who was called by Jesus by the lake shore. And Peter, James, and John in the Synoptic Gospels are always going off with Jesus. They're kind of the, the inner circle. But what's curious about this is that none of those stories are in John's Gospel. You would think that if he was the author, he would include the story of his own call to ministry. Nor is there much of the Gospel of John that takes place in Galilee. It's curious. It's also curious that, that John, unlike the Synoptics, doesn't provide us with a list of the Apostles. There's very little of the ministry of Galilee. It picks up with the calling of disciples, but they're the disciples of John the Baptist who go over to Jesus. Jason's going to talk about that next week in chapter 1, where we see these disciples of John suddenly become disciples of Jesus, particularly after John is put in prison. The stories in John's gospel are more centered in Judea and Jerusalem than they are in Galilee. So if John the apostle is the writer, it's curious why he would have left so much of that detail out, having grown up in Galilee and seen much of Jesus' ministry there. So if it's not this apostle, then who is it? Well, the only thing the text tells us is that the writer refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, the beloved disciple. Who was this person? Well, I did a lot of research on that this week, and some scholars suggest that this was a disciple of Jesus who was a Judean disciple. He wasn't there in Galilee, which is why we don't get the Galilee stories, but rather was one who picked up the ministry of Jesus when he came to Judea, when he visited Jerusalem. Much of the story takes place there, as I said earlier. The author appears to be a Jew, but he also appears to be writing to an audience that doesn't have much Jewish background because he explains things to them. And he uses the generic term, the Jews, to talk about the people of Israel. And while the synoptic gospels seem to be written to communities that are already Christian, already churches, to teach them how to be like Jesus, hence the Sermon on the Mount, hence the parables and so forth, the Gospel of John seems to be written to people who don't know Jesus. And therefore, it's the most evangelistic of the four Gospels. It's the one that's written to introduce people. And the people who Jesus encounters in John are often those who are on the fringes, just like those who might be reading this Gospel for the first time. We notice the prologue, which we read earlier. Diana read for us. We also read it on Christmas Eve. John's gospel starts very much unlike the others. I mean, we always at Christmas time start the gospel of Luke with Mary and Joseph on their way to Bethlehem and their shepherds and angels or, or we read the, the Matthew version which is about the, the wise men coming to visit and King Herod and, and all of that. John doesn't have anything about the birth of Jesus. Instead, he begins with a theological statement. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That Word 
in Greek is logos, which implies wisdom. And interestingly, one of the things that both Romans and Jews had in common in the first century is that they were both very much into wisdom literature. There's plenty of wisdom literature in the Bible and the Old Testament. There's also a lot of wisdom literature that was written outside the Old Testament. Romans were always seeking wisdom. Their philosophers always seeking wisdom. And here John sort of addresses both ends of the spectrum by saying this logos, this wisdom, has existed from the beginning. It was there with God in the beginning, but this wisdom has become embodied. Embodied in Jesus Christ, who was and is God. The Word became flesh. It's a profound statement, a profound way to start the gospel, that this person about whom John is writing is fully God and fully man, a unique individual. And therefore, that makes this the most important biography that's ever been written. We see other evidence in the New Testament that the person who wrote the Gospel of John was a prolific writer. If you read 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, Diana read for us from 1st John. Do you notice how similar? How similar 1st John and and the Gospel of John seem to sound? There's There's a powerful connection there. And so a lot of scholars believe that the same person or at least a community of persons wrote both of these together. Same person might have written Revelation as well. And there he refers to himself as John the elder. And so a lot of scholars think that this was a disciple who was connected to the others, not necessarily one of the 12, but one who followed Jesus around. And he calls himself the beloved disciple. And it's not just about an ego trip for him. It's about inviting us to consider as we read, as those who may not know Jesus would read that they too can become beloved disciples. This disciple became known throughout the Christian world after the apostles died. But this is an eyewitness account. The beloved disciple was a witness to the life of Jesus, but his biography is more than what we normally think of with biography. I mean, I read a biography of Winston Churchill. I find it fascinating. But once I'm done with it, I've got some idea about what life was like during World War II, what life was like in the late 19th century when Churchill grew up through his his career. He died in 1965. So you've got this incredible span of time that you're reading about. and, and, And I love that. And I love the connection and how it shapes our modern world. But ultimately, I'll put that on the shelf and, and walk away from it. I, I like to have those big, thick books on my shelf because it, it's supposed to impress the people who come and see the library. You know, that's some, uh, we do that, don't we? You know, so maybe just I do that. I don't know about you, but, but, uh, but I, like, I like to read those, those books. And, but but it's, not, it's something you can walk away from. This biography, not quite. See, while most biographies are written for interest, perhaps some inspiration, information, John's gospel is an invitation. It's an invitation to have an encounter with its subject, Jesus Christ. Notice what John says, John chapter 20, verse 31. These things were written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's son, and that believing you will have life in his name. It's an invitation. 1 John 1, 1 to 4, again, we announce to you what, we have, what has existed from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have seen in our hands have handled about the word of life. What we have seen and heard, we also announce it to you so that you can have fellowship with us. In other words, when I'm connected to this story, it changes me. This story is not one that I can merely read and set aside. It's a story that I'm invited to become part. That's why it's good news, a gospel. It's not merely interesting or informational or inspirational. It's invitational. It invites the reader to give his or her life to the subject, who is Jesus the Christ, to have an encounter with him, to be in conversation with him, to become part of his family, to receive what John says in the prologue, the power, the authority, the right to become children of God. That's why John begins his gospel so differently. 
It's an invitation. And when John gives us this invitation, and when he tells the story, when he starts it, he goes all the way back to the beginning. The opening lines of his gospel are designed to take us all the way back to Genesis, back to the creation of the world. Because the story that John is about to tell is the story of the one who was there from the beginning, who was and is God himself. And so his biography is not just about a historical person named Jesus of Nazareth, but rather it's really the biography of the God who created the universe, the God who is revealed now in the human face of Jesus. Notice how chapter 1, verse 18 ends this section. No one has ever seen God, says the writer. God, the only son who was at the father's side, has made him known. If you want to know God, says John, you will see him in the face of Jesus. This is a biography that is breathtaking in scope. And yet, in my Bible, it only takes up 26 pages, not 1,500. It's the biography that does not allow the reader to stand at a distance walking through events. Instead, it invites the reader to be there, to stand in place of each person who encounters Jesus. It's an invitation to skeptics and seekers like Nicodemus, who in chapter 3 comes to Jesus by night to see what's going on. He doesn't want anybody else to know that he's talking with Jesus. It's an invitation to people with a checkered past, like the Samaritan woman at the well in chapter 4. It's an invitation to those who need a new vision of life, like the man born blind in chapter 9. It's a vision for people who need new life, like Lazarus and Mary and Martha in chapter 11. It's for people who need to be confronted with the truth like Pontius Pilate or people who need hope like Mary Magdalene or people who need forgiveness like Peter who denied his Lord three times. It's a biography that has ultimate relevance because it's not bound by time and space. It's not the story of one who once lived, but one who has been alive from the beginning and who was also risen from the dead and is present with us now. The one who is still living and active in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the story of a life that, as John says, was and is the light for all people. It's the ultimate biography of the world's most important person. The one who is full of grace and truth, who wants to make us all into his beloved disciples. I think that's why the writer calls himself that. Because he wants us to experience the same intimacy. To be beloved disciples of Jesus too. To find ourselves in the midst of this story. It's a story that invites us to tell our own stories about our encounter with Jesus. And to share those stories with those who don't know him. See, John is so excited. I, I got to tell you what we saw, what we touched, what we heard, what we walked around and, and experienced. We, we have to share that story. Can, do we have the same zeal to share our story about Jesus, our encounter with him? It's a story that's not confined within the walls of a museum or in the pages of a book. It's a story that's to be written on our hearts and shared with the world. And we need to hear that story again. We need to understand it, to see it with fresh eyes, especially in a world that has largely forgotten the story. How will they discover it? They'll discover it in us. It's a story that has to take on flesh. E. Stanley Jones, the great Methodist missionary to India in the early 20th century, uh, wrote about the difficulty of bringing the gospel to that Hindu land. He said there were three objections that the Indians always had. One, that the gospel isn't true, it isn't new, and it isn't you. 
people saw it and they said, well, well we have our religion, we have this, and, and we see you, hear you talking about Jesus, but, but we don't see too much of that being acted out in front of us. As Mahatma Gandhi, who was a friend of E. Stanley Jones, once said, he says, I love your Christ, but not your Christians. The word became flesh. We live in a culture that's saying the same thing. Our Christianity has become so enculturated. It looks like everything else out there. It isn't true. It isn't new. It isn't you, Christians. It's easy to ignore. That's because we've allowed the word to become word instead of flesh. But when we have an authentic encounter with Jesus, it changes us. It makes us different. We need to recapture that story and experience it in our own lives. We need to meet Jesus again and John will introduce us to him in conversations that will change our lives. So I hope you will dive deep with us into gospel, in the gospel of John because I think when you do, you're gonna discover your story is different as you meet Jesus again, maybe for the first time. On the eve of his 75th birthday, Winston Churchill famously said, I'm prepared to meet my maker. Whether my maker is prepared for the great ordeal of meeting me is another matter. (laughs) That quote is at the end of the museum as you go out of the Churchill exhibit. I love that. In the Gospel of John, we will indeed meet our maker. And he will meet us wherever we happen to be. He is ready to rewrite all of our stories. So it's time to pick up the book, the greatest biography ever written, and encounter the one who will change your story forever. Are you ready? Let's pray. Lord, we are thankful for this great story. And not just a story, but a reality. A reality that can be touched and seen and heard witnessed. Lord, help us not to take the scriptures as, a, as something we keep on the shelf, but rather something that becomes flesh in us. You became like us so that we could become more like you. Empower us, Lord, to live this life, to live your story. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen.